My wife is harder to book than anybody. I'll tell you why right now. This is not her thing. But my wife has an amazing story. Uh, she actually has something really to say. And she doesn't say it too often. I think this is going to help a lot of moms out there, a lot of couples. Um, because one of my favorite quotes is by Miles Monroe. And he said, you don't tell a leader by the medals they wear on their chest. You can tell a leader by the scars that they have on their back. Dude. And my wife, Terry, got some scars. And you know, he had hit me on the side of the house, like close fist punched me on the side of the house. And I ended up getting by him with blood gushing down my face. So um, like straight up, he beat you. He did. Yeah. Which kind of leads, leads me into like, you know, the path that I took after that, too. You know, Which was drugs. That's, I mean, a big reason why. Before we get started today, I would be remiss if I did not thank our partners over at Proper Creative. Proper Creative is a production on demand company and they monetize e commerce platforms. They have a marketing powerhouse team from graphic designers, web development, photographers, videographers, market analysis, digital marketing strategists, and of course, social media experts. They help companies from development of content and products to the execution of digital strategies for e-commerce. They provide both full service and a la carte services for businesses that sell direct to the consumers. For me today, I am wearing a proper creative branded shirt. This is the Level Up Podcast shirt. You can get it. And uh, this is something that we send to all of our guests that come on our show. Our partners send them a gift package, and it's brought to you by Proper Creative. Thank you so much. You can follow them on social media, Instagram primarily, at P-R-O-P-R Creative. Again, they're an L.A.-based company, so they do things a little bit cooler than most. They spell proper, P-R-O-P-R Creative. Follow them on social media, Instagram, and give a shout-out. Thank you so much, again, to our brand partners, Proper Creative. Welcome to another week of Level Up with Matt Rogers. I am your host, the one and only Matt Rogers. And as uh, as as with me, as always, with me, as always. Nailed it. The one and only <laughs> Eli Adelman. Hey, buddy. Engineer. Yep. President. Yeah. First man. <laughs> yep. Both. D- dude, are you as pumped about our guest today dude, as I, I am? I am. No, I'm not. excited. No, I well, probably not as much because it's, I won't put, you know, spoil it. But anyway. It's more related to you, but uh, I'm excited because like it's our very first podcast we ever did that hasn't been released, right? Like it's we talked, secret. we talked about ever. right. We talked about how we didn't know each other like at all. Yeah, and so I'm excited to get to know you and this guest. Who's the guest? Do you want me to say? Sure. It's your wife. It's my wife is in the house. <laughs> yeah, baby. The one and only Terry Rogers. Here she is. Let me just kind of let me just kind of set the stage for everybody on why this is a big deal. Y'all don't even know. This is the hardest book uh, guest to book. This is hands down the hardest guest for me to book. We've had celebrities on here. We've had Grammy winners. We've had life coaches. We've had speakers. We've had business, you know, entrepreneurs, multimillionaires that are, you know, some would say hard to book my wife is harder to book than anybody i'll tell you why right now and uh i would also say she's probably busier than all of them put together um this is not her thing but my wife has an amazing story uh obviously awesome wife mother of three kids two um that have been battling cystic fibrosis since birth and she's just got an amazing story the thing that i love about my wife is like a lot of people do this you know a lot of like podcasters or hosts whatever like they want to incorporate their wives into it which is fine i'm totally cool with that and and like maybe give their wives a platform to speak or something like that you know because and there's a lot of them out there that you know these tag team couples that it's like forced right this isn't that because my wife doesn't want a platform my wife doesn't like to speak she doesn't like to do this but she actually has something really to say and she doesn't say it too often. I think this is going to help a lot of moms out there, a lot of couples um, because one of my favorite quotes is by Miles Monroe. And he said, you don't tell a leader by the medals they wear on their chest. You can tell a leader by the scars that they have on their back. Dude. And my wife, Terry got some scars 
and she doesn't talk about it too often. So hopefully I'll be a good host and you'll be comfortable with me today to talk about some things. So welcome, babe. Thanks for having me. Oh my God, you look super hot right now. <laughs> What's your name? Oh my God. Um, let's be honest, how do you feel right now? I mean, I know it's kind of weird, like we're in our house and we're like having a conversation like this. Yeah, I feel good. Do you, are you yeah. nervous? I'm a little nervous. Is she close enough to the microphone? Um, yeah, she's coming through. Maybe a little. These closer. are all new things for me. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. What do you? You can move it closer to you if you want. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what there are you go. nervous about? Um, like, be honest. What are you nervous about? Just telling my story, being real. That's not me. Being real is not, you know, laying the cards out. I'm real, but I don't really lay my my cards out all the time. You're a very private person. Absolutely. And you don't like. I mean, you like you said, you don't like to air all your stuff out there. My wife doesn't like people to feel bad for her. Yeah. And so, but there's also something, you know, it's really cool to be transparent and vulnerable and you know, none of us really like to do it. So honestly, like, I appreciate you coming on and doing this because I know it's not your thing, right? but you do have an amazing story to tell. Uh, as always, let's start from the beginning. <laughs> Where are you from? You grew up. What were your parents like? All of that stuff. Well, I grew up in Orange County, California, in Anaheim Hills. Great family. I have two older sisters. Mom and dad married forever. Um, played soccer. Super busy in the community. I mean, born and raised there and lived there all the way until you and I got engaged. That's when my parents sold our childhood home. But, you know, same place, same town, same parents, same sisters, same, you know, pretty ordinary beginning. You know, good life, traveled, good family, good parents. You're a really good soccer player, too, before okay. we met, huh? I was okay. Come on, be honest. <laughs> How good were you? I was pretty good, yeah. I mean, we had the same soccer team mm -hmm. forever. We had this team that I was on called Double Trouble. We played together, same group of girls. I mean, I think from elementary school, like up and through high, into high school, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, so it was the same girls. I'm still friends with some of those girls to this day on Facebook. Just like a real tight knit group. Anaheim Hills was like a tight community, you know, just family oriented. It was it was good. The I had cool a good thing, childhood. The cool thing about my wife, Eli, is that like, you know, she's very modest and like kind of soft spoken right here. But dude, when like women's soccer is on <laughs> or any like sporting event like the Titans or something, bro. Kids in it. Yeah. You think I'm loud? <laughs> she gets like angry That's and funny. like throws stuff and like you idiot! It's, it's awesome. It's really. I'm a little competitive. You should, you should uh, be Eli, a coach. I'm a little competitive. I know. I'm scared. <laughs> well, it's fun. like if we go to Titans games and stuff. Like you know, normally it's the wife saying, "Honey, you know, sit down. You're embarrassing us." Right. It's me being like, "Okay, babe, you probably want to calm down a little bit." <laughs> and that's coming from you, which I know. is crazy. Seriously, that's yeah, awesome. That's but, a whole different story in a different day. <laughs> but you, so you are a really good soccer player. Mm -hmm. But like, what happened? How come you didn't like? go pro or anything like that because you had the talent i had the talent you know honestly and it's i see it even in ath athletics today as a and now as a parent i see it in athletics today like just so much politics you know we had professional coaches mm -hmm. we had you know the parents the parents got involved and you know parents getting involved is great support's great but the hard thing i think too was it went over the, above support and it became like politics and, you know, the kids, a lot of kids are let burned, get burned out because the parents get too involved. And not my parents, per se, were right. too involved. They were supportive. Of course, not your parents. Well, you know. Because you know your dad's listening right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, they were supportive. They never missed a game. They went ever with us. But they never got involved in the stuff that made it not fun. So I think that kind of burned me out. And I was, you know, I loved this. I love the sport. I still love the sport. But, you know. Parents can ruin things. That's one thing. And again, you're uh, for real. You're not saying your parents. No. Yeah. Just parents involved. Like, you know, those parents that take it too far or, you know, it's more, you know, and yeah, everyone wants to win. I'm the first one, but mm -hmm. they took it too far and they was all about more than just the game. And then they took the fun out of the game. So when you went to college, you went to San Diego State. Correct. Go Aztecs. Go Aztecs. And how come you didn't play soccer at San Diego State? Um, politics. Really? You know, hindsight's, you know, something interesting though. I wish I had made a different decision, but at that time I just was in a different place. I had a boyfriend that was going to go to college with me. 
I know I had a boyfriend before you. Sorry. Well, no, because we'll talk about um, that because I met you when you had the boyfriend. <laughs> it's actually a funny story. But go ahead. Yeah. So I was just in a different place. Like I had made some choices that led me down a, a, a path of maybe pushing soccer away. But had I gone, you know, looking backwards, I think we all have regrets. And I think that was that might have been my one of my biggest regrets at that time in my life. You know, do you think honestly, because you you know, it wasn't the healthiest relationship that you're in the, the boyfriend. We'll Correct. be talking about that in a second. Because I do think that there's a lot of women, maybe even married women, that are in unhealthy relationships. So I do want to talk about how you got out, why you got out, because it really was unhealthy when you Absolutely. and I met and you were with this guy. Um, if if you hadn't been in that relationship with that guy, do you think your soccer career would have went farther? I think so. But, I mean, that was my choice. I can't blame anyone else right. but me for that. I mean, I think it would have gone farther. I think I would have looked broader for places to go to school. Like my sister, my older sister, mm -hmm. Tammy, was going to San Diego State. So it was like a safe place too. You know, when I went to college, I was just turned 18 and I was the youngest of the family. So I think there was a little bit of safety in going to San Diego State because she was there. Mm -hmm. So it was comfortable. And it was like, an, you know, an hour and a half from my house. It was, it was easy. So right. I think I would have chose there. And then I think had I not made those choices, I think I would have looked at other schools. When you say like those choices, are you talking about like comfortability? You took can I say, did you take the easy I did. road? I took the easy road because I was, I had a 4.2 GPA. Mm. I was definitely overqualified for the school. <clears throat> I could have played soccer at a lot of schools. I'm not going to say right. anywhere, but you know, a lot of places. Um, and I just kind of took the easy road. Was it a combination of, Hey, my sister's here. It's close to home. And I have this boy or was it more so I'm with this boy? I think combo combo. Yeah. So yeah. when when you and I met, you you went from San Diego State to Long <clears throat> Beach, Long Beach State, Long Beach State, where I graduated from, to where you graduated from. You got a degree. You also got a degree for your boyfriend. So you pretty much have two <laughs> degrees. Because from what you tell me, you did all the work for him, which is yeah. awesome. You do all the work for me today, and we've been married now for sixteen years. Um, when when I met you, it was two thousand one. I was a mortgage <clears throat> uh, loan officer. And this was after 9-11, interest rates went through the floor and we were on like a hiring frenzy at uh, the one and only Four Corners Financial. <laughs> where it, it all began. Where it all started. <laughs> no joke, Eli, she walks in and I know she's going to be like, oh, shut up, whatever. But dude, she oh, walks <laughs> in, freaking jaw dropper. You were that, that was it. And we, dude, we worked in a testosterone factory. It was yes. like before, you know, um, you know, the Me Too movement. This right. is before you know basically women had before hr yeah before <laughs> hr like women had no rights right. in the workplace right. like really saw they had me. no they women had a lot of rights in the workplace just here it was a lot of you know it didn't flow like normal it wasn't a corporation that had a lot of rules right. you know what i mean it was it was it was right. just different you got to give props to that though oh know? for sure dude <laughs> i mean look at how much we grew it's yeah. like i mean now it's so over corrected yeah. and over politically correct like dude you can't even do anything it's like yeah all of you would have never had jobs oh my god <laughs> i would have been fired 17 times over with um but she comes in everyone loves her she's like she said 4.2 gpa and like we're all like you know asking the boss his name was rigo and you know what rigo if he's listening he was really good to us he was good he was a good boss he's the reason that her and i met we could talk about that in a second but uh, he was just, he was just really, really good to us. And I appreciate him to this day for many things. Um, but we all go up to him. We're like, Rigo, what is she like? Blah, blah, blah. He's like, dude, calm down. Like <laughs> she's got a 4.2 GPA, San Diego state soccer girl. I'm like, this is great news. Cause you know, all the guys thought that I have a 2.4. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I had a 1.96, but all the guys thought like, dude, I'm going to score this girl. Blah, blah, blah. And I thought the same thing. And he's like, but take it easy. Yeah. She's had a boyfriend for six years. And I was just like, oh, you let daddy worry about that. <laughs> I'll get her sooner or later. Um, it was later, not sooner. <laughs> it, it was later. <laughs> it was later. So yes. I like you a lot in the beginning when a handful well, of so other guys. So I got guys, hired, obviously. You got hired. Yeah, got hired. Um, and, you know, and at first I was, you know, putting the full court press on. I feel, and be honest, like you're not going to embarrass me. I feel like you kind of liked me, but you were really loyal to the other yeah. guy. And then I started dating a girl from church and giving you less attention. And that bothered you, right? I think any girl in that, in the situation I was in would have loved the attention. 
it was not what I was, you know. Okay, so let's talk elsewhere. about that. Yeah. What situation were you in? Like, real talk, what was going on? Because you say you were in a bad relationship. Like, what was this guy doing? What happened? So, um, I mean, you know, like you said, I was in, I mean, I was still there, which I think true. I think I see it and even in today, you know, I was with him for, I want to say maybe eight years altogether. I mean, we lived together in Long Beach. I went to San Diego, so we went to high school together, started dating him in high school, um, my senior year, went down to San Diego State together, left there after a couple of years because I wasn't getting much done down there. Wonder why. Um, <laughs> And decided to go to uh, Long Beach State to finish my degree. I was a business major with an uh, emphasis in marketing. And decided to go to Long Beach to get stuff done, to finish it up, and, you know, start focusing a little bit more because it took me five years to get out of school. Um, I mean, there was a point in Long Beach where I had 21 units one semester because I had failed to do much in San Diego. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so, you, you know, partied a lot. I partied a lot, yeah. yeah. I mean, I was, you know, I was in a sorority down there. Um, you know, San Diego State was known at the... What was the name of your sorority? Um, I was a Pi Phi. And what do we call them? You don't need to say that. <laughs> Pi, Pi Phi put outs. <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't you. Uh, uh, yes, it was not me. Um, all the foot, you know, well, you're a typical football player. You got to have a nickname for everything. I'm a meathead. You're a meathead. And I used to call that, yeah. you that too. Um, but hey, we always win in the end. <laughs> Football rules. All right, keep going. Sorry. So, yeah, we um, went to, so we ended up in Long Beach um, and we lived together. So I was, you know, like playing the wife role real pretty much, you know, without a ring on it. Girlfriend, you know, taking care of everything. And he was going to school. He was going, he had a job doing, you know, here, odds and ends here and there, but super abusive and super mentally and physically not a good guy. So abusive. When people say mentally abusive, yeah. I've never been mentally abused before. At least I don't think so. What does that mean? Just, I mean, words that cut, you know, like I remember one time we had gone out on the, like we lived on the streets on second street, which is in like Belmont shore. And, um, you would go, we walk, we are, we are, our place was right there. So we went out with a bunch of friends and, you know, partied, hung out till two o'clock in the morning, came home and. You know, he had hit me on the side of the house, like closed fist punched me on the side of the house and, you know, said a lot of horrible things, but no one backed it. Like he, he left, he, he jumped the fence and left. He punched you and ran away. Yeah. Well, cause he, 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 you know, he was on the side of the house and told me he wasn't going to let me make it to the other, you know, I was trying to save my life pretty much. I ended up getting by him with blood gushing down my face. So um, like straight up, he beat you. He did. Yeah. So, and it, it, it wasn't like every day, you know, like the physical part wasn't every day, but there was enough times where, I mean, when you have to hide those things from people, you know that you're in a bad place. But I remember coming back in, I don't know if it was this time or another time, but coming back in our room, going out and stuff and, you know, like drinking and all that stuff doesn't make those things better. Sure. You know, and I think certain drinks, you know, for some people make them a different person. Mm -hmm. But I remember coming back into our bedroom one night and I think it, I don't know if it was, I don't think it was the same night. It could have been the same night, um, which is sad because if I don't know which night it was, obviously it was happening a lot. Sure. Um, and he had taken a Sharpie and he had wrote all over the walls, like bad things like, you like know, what? You, what? You, you, you fat bee, you know, you, you know, you're fat, you're ugly. I mean, Sharpie on the walls, like, and then, you know, had knives in bed with them. So, I mean, like, these are what things the that... So, how do you... Like, what goes through your mind when you're walking into that? Because, um, first of all, when I, I saw... you kind of check out, you know? You just don't... I don't really... People are like... And there was a point where I he left for a few days, but I ended up getting back with him, and everyone would be like, why'd you go back? Why'd you go back? And I hear it today, too, like, why'd you stay with him? I mean, why thank the Lord I did not have kids and I wasn't married to him. Why did you stay with him? Um, I don't know. Because I mean, I, mean, I can't even answer that. I mean, you're a soccer player... You weren't fat. No. Right. But I mean, at the time when he says it, did you think you were fat? Well, yeah, I think you start believing what anyone tells you. Which kind of leads, leads me into like, you know, the path that I took after that too. You know, Which was? Drugs. That's, I mean, a big reason why I got into, you know, when I met you and met the girl at where we were working. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I had, I had dabbled in stuff. 
like, you know, I've like party drugs. Yeah. Party. I mean, you know, which is, you know, I smoked pot. I drank. Right. I did a few things here and there mm-hmm. that, you know, one time things. I never like did things. Um, but see, I was always, you know, I was, I was always still able to perform and do my thing. Um, but, you know, he wore on me and wore on me and wore on me until, you know, I think what the problem was when I met that girl at the work that we were working at, um, I think that's why I was so quick to do whatever was going on because I was miserable. So when you say you met the girl, this is when you and I met. Um, <clears throat> she was kind of like your co-worker and boss in a lot of ways because she kind of headed up the processing department where you work. Um, she was going through her stuff. She was in a bad place. You were going through your stuff. You were in a bad place. And this girl had a very negative influence on you, right? Very. To where you started doing this stuff. And real quick for the, for the listeners. So we're having a real conversation with my wife. Uh, when I asked her to come on the show, the biggest concern is a, she wants to be real and transparent and let you guys know where she's been and what she's done. But B, we also have some young kids like we, you know, my wife and I, we have a 15 year old, 13 year old and a six year old. So you kind of want to be cautious of, you know, you don't want your kids to know all this stuff. And at the same time, it's like, look, this was my past. Like, right. Like, right. But you don't want your kids to ever be like, well, mom and dad did it. So I'm probably going to do it. or something. I I don't know. I I don't know what the answer is. I'm just talking out loud. Like this. But I know you never want to lie. So I think it's just like finding that balance of being honest with, you know, it's a balance. Totally. Yeah. So you meet this girl. This is before you and I start dating. Right. I kind of like you. You weren't really feeling me. You're with this guy. Um, and you meet this girl. Yeah. Let's call her Nancy. Okay. Okay. So you meet Nancy. And what does Nancy do? Why did you and her start being friends and what happened? So we just became friends. I mean, I had, because I was in this relationship with that person, <clears throat> I had no, besides his buddies, mm-hmm. I really had no, he was ever, he was my whole thing. Like I had not a lot of extra friends on the side, super close to my family still. Um, but we hung out with like his friends and their girlfriends or whatever. Um, and then I had people at work. I was worked at a coffee shop. I had like, you know, a few friends at the coffee shop that, you know, I, I was like friends with like work friends with. Um, so her and I worked really close together at, at the company, Nancy and I, and we, Worked a lot of hours. We were super busy. I spent a lot of time with her. And then um, we went to lunch one day and I did, you know, I tried a drug for the first time and that was the end of it. And the end of it mean the beginning of it. Yeah. And it gripped you. Gripped me instantly. Like, like how? You don't have to say what it was or what, but like, how did it grip you? It's just that when people say like, you know, people don't know what they don't know. And I had heard it before, like, if you do it one time, it, you know, in, in a, a lot of it has to do with your personality, too. Mm-hmm. But if you do it one time, like, don't ever do it one time. Do You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Because that one time is, for some people, is is the beginning of the end. And I did it one time. And, I mean, it like, I loved the way I felt. It also made me feel great, make me forget about where I was at, you know. And then within within a month... I was hooked. I was spending, I mean, I had my own dealer. I mean, I was, I was in. Right. I mean, I was doing it all day long, every day, you know, hundreds of dollars a week. Um, and, you know, the other part of you that, you know, when someone's writing on the wall that you're fat and you're all these things, right. you start dropping weight like that. It's interesting what you tell yourself, you know, you tell yourself like, now what? How skinny did you get? Oh, gosh. At my peak yeah. of being... Or you were low, right? My low. What would it... um, oh, in the, ni- like in the 90s. I mean, you saw me. Yeah. I was wearing kid size, like size 10 and 12. I was tiny. I remember looking in the mirror one time. Um, this was, you know, after I was already in, looking in the mirror and turning around one day and like just not even barely recognizing me because I was like... Gosh, I'm so skinny. But you just think about that for a second, and then you don't think about what it. What did anymore. you see when you looked in the mirror? Not me. Skinny, bones. I mean, tiny. You know? just But you look at it, and then you go straight back to what you're doing. It's, a, it's just, there's no answer for it. And everyone's like, well, what about your family? You know? I have a great family, but 
I lived on my own. I lived away. And I think some people don't want to see things, you know, what's mm -hmm. going on. I mean, even my boyfriend at that time, when I finally later told him like, hey, I'm doing this. You're stupid. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. what do you think I've been doing? Like, wh where have you been? Like, right. I went from, you know, like, what do you like? Almost kind of, I almost felt like, you know, he was oblivious to it, too. So I have so many questions right here. First question is, what could your family have done different? Because they saw you. They probably knew what was going on. Maybe they did or didn't ask you. I don't know if we've ever even really talked about this before. But could they have done anything different to save you or help you? I, I, I took the interesting thing about what when you're on something or doing something that you know you're not supposed to do, you tried to hide and tried to distance yourself. So I tried. I mean, I always saw my, you know, I was always with my family. Um but I'd really pulled back and like wouldn't show up to things. Mm -hmm. And if I did show up to things, I'd be hours late. Like I think everyone had an idea, but were was afraid to maybe admit that I had something going on mm -hmm. because I was still functioning. Like, you know, I wasn't on the street corner or I wasn't, right. you know, knocking on their front door saying like, help me. You like, were, you were an unbelievable processor and you were still getting it done. And I remember, and this probably had a lot to do with the drugs, I would get in there at, let's just say nine. You had already been there for two hours. I would leave at six and you would stay till midnight. Oh, like yeah. you worked nonstop. And I mean, you know, you fill your, your life with things that you choose to fill your life with because, you know, that makes you what at the time you think is satisfying. You know, my choice at that time was not to go home. My choice was, you know, working and doing what I thought was at that time, after a while, it wasn't what I wanted to do. It was just what I had to do. Like, I didn't want to do that drug anymore, but, you know, that's, that's just what I did because it was, it was easy. So a few things can happen here in someone in, in your state right here. You could either OD, mm -hmm. and that's not good. Uh, you could either go to rehab. Um, I mean, what other options are there? You could have an intervention, and, you know, we've seen that show. Mm -hmm. What was your rock bottom? What like when did you think like and did you ever I mean, did you ever want to take your life? Did you ever want to die? Did you think you were gonna die? I don't I think I didn't care, which is kind of a sad like there was times I remember driving like our office from because we after I graduated Long Beach, um, I moved in with my sister, um, who had bought a condo in Tustin. And me and my boyfriend at the time moved in. I mean, it got bad and he ended up moving to the room next to it. And, and that's a whole different story. But um, I, I remember, you know, driving home sometimes from work and thinking like, you know, you have like instant thoughts of I could, I could drive off right here. I remember being on the five freeway driving towards Tustin Ranch Road. And, you know, you take that curve around and you yeah. drop in. And I remember thinking like I could run into that wall right there. And no one would care. And then, you know, you like kind of snap out of it and think like, no, I can't. I can't do that. But, you know, I wasn't thinking, I wasn't thinking straight, you know, I wasn't thinking right. So what happened for you? Like what was rock bottom? So um, rock bottom, which is kind of like a double edged sword because <laughs> I was so <laughs> mad because I, I think I tried to hide it from everyone at work, but it was totally obvious that I was doing something. Everyone knew. We all knew. They all knew. Um, but my our, my boss um, at the time, Rigo, he... Um, we could say his name because he's kind of like the hero in this whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> he came to me and, you know, it was hard. Like, he's trying to run a business and, you know, here... And he always... He knew, like, my... He had known who my dad was. My dad, you know, worked at a building across the street in commercial real estate. Like, my dad had come in. Like, so he knew my family. Like, he knew I was... Came from a good place, you know? And so he had said, um, he called me in his office and said, hey, um, I'm going to drug test you. And I was like, and this is like the place that has no like right. real like strict anything. <laughs> like, you know, it wasn't out of control, but there, you know, you didn't drug test. You didn't have a compliant HR department. You didn't have, it True. was just kind of, you know, it was what it was. Um, so he said, I'm going to drug test you. And I, on the inside, freaked out. Um, not only was he going to, I was going to lose, probably lose my job because I know I wasn't going to pass. Um, but I was going to have to, you know, admit to everyone what I already know, what everyone already knew. But when you come at someone who's in, was in my state of mind, 
usually they get angry. And that's exactly what I got. So I went home that night. He told me he was going to do it the next day. I had to go to this place and test. Um, and long story short, it wasn't. I tested the next day, but I mean, when you are doing what I'm doing, you find every way to beat the test. And you beat it. I beat it. But just because there's a lot of ways to do that. So I did. So you found a way to beat it and you beat it? Mm-hmm. Would we trip out if we found out I how you totally beat it? Totally trip out. Do you want to tell us or no? It's just, yeah, you, it's not your, you can't take anything because I was on, I was on hard drugs. I wasn't on like pot. So, right. <laughs> um, and I had done it that morning. So I knew I was never going to, whatever. So my drug dealer told me to go to this place and they give you like a vial mm -hmm. of what constitutes like the makeup of what, you know, the test would be like. Right. And you bring that in with you and you, so you basically used fake urine. Yeah. But see, someone's there watching you take the test. So how do you do that? So you get creative. And you got creative. I got creative. But I was so nervous doing the the test because, I mean, it's nerve-wracking. It's so nerve-wracking. Not only are you doing it, I mean, there's for so many reasons that I, I was so shaky that I had only filled up a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. And so I... Took it, you know, angry. I'm, I'm in an angry state right now. I'm not, I'm, I'm mad. I go back to the office, or actually I went home, and I told him I wasn't coming back in. Because um, it was his fault. You're mad at him. I'm right? mad at him. It's his fault. And I told him, <laughs> I'm going to pass your stupid drug test, so it doesn't matter. So I went home, of course, cried, went to sleep, because now by then I'm trying to sober up a little bit. It's crazy when I hear you talk, it's crazy how arrogant and angry someone can be, but behind closed doors, you're so miserable yeah. and sad. So yeah. it's all a front, which is just kind of like a little sidebar there. If you're inter if you're interacting with someone like that, like take into consideration what they're going through and Absolutely. and maybe love them a little bit more and a little bit harder. Uh and I mean that must have happened, right? Cuz you you end up turning it around. So what happened? So he um I mean, I don't even know how it all went down after that, but he pretty much said, like, he he called and came by and said, hey, you know, you need to get better. Like, I, I feel he felt guilty because he felt like he introduced me to this person, mm -hmm. to Nancy, and um, and he was felt bad. And, you know, and he said, I, I need to get you better. What do you know? What can it take? And I said, you know, I broke down and cried and said, you know, I want to get better, but. I don't know if I can, like, you know, it's a scary place to be in. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's when he kind of pulled you in the mix and said, you know, you need to help, you need to help this girl. But at that time, no one wanted anything to do with me. Right. I was, I was that girl, you know, I was in charge of your guys' business. Um, I was, I was deep in, in a mess. Here's the crazy thing. And it's a sad thing too. And I'll look at you, Eli, when I say this, it's, <sighs> Our boss, Rigo, very, very nice man, kind man, has a good heart. He's an open atheist. Then you got me, who is an open Christian. He approaches me and says, you need to help this girl. The atheist approaches the Christian. The Christian says, no, I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. I was like a Pharisee, dude. Right. Like, I was so religious. I'm like... You were a different person at that time, I was too. a different person at that time, but at the same time, like, dude, my parents raised me right, and... I don't know how I got there or where we got there, but my reaction was, no, dude, just fire her. Like, wow. throw her away. Let her go. Like, she's bad for business. All this stuff. Would have stuff. been the worst thing that could ever happen to me. It would have been the worst thing. And it just, it makes me sad about myself. Again, I'm a different person now, but like, how many Christians respond that way to broken people? Right. Yeah, turn I her mean, back. It happens every day, all the time. And I've been one of them. I'm one of them. And it's just. But I've it, heard, like you said, I've heard before in, in, you know, and you've said it and I've heard other people say it like, well, why don't you just get out of the relationship and stop doing what you're doing? Right. And it's like, it's not that easy. You know what I mean? Like until you've experienced it and walked through anything, I don't think you can say to someone, well, just quit it. You know, it's so much more complicated. And I was in a complicated nightmare with my boyfriend and, and where I was at, like with drugs and everything. So I was, you know, I think it's important, like you said, like, you don't really know what someone's walking through or what someone's going through. You know, you can only see the outside and some people don't want to take their time to help. You know, if you didn't take your time to help you, I don't know what would have happened. I think God really changed my heart. And it, it was, 
It was the guy that I was working with. His name's Eric Johnson. He was my pastor's son. And he was the one telling me like, dude, check yourself, man. Like we got to help this girl. And it wasn't like we got to help this girl. I'm not saying it the right way, but like he just loved her and loved people. And he's the one that invited you to church, not me. Mm -hmm. So Terry starts coming to church and then like tell him like what happened. Cause you and I are not dating at this point yeah. and not really interested in each other. And this really, is after right? I had to like the Monday morning meeting at work. Right. That was humility. Yeah. At the highest you had to go in front of, you know, 20 men, 20 year old, 30 year old men. And lay out my dirty laundry mm -hmm. just to like, you know, which they already all knew. And it was humiliating. And right. I wanted to crawl in a hole. Cause obviously talking to people in public is not my thing, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, um, just to, you know, admit being, having to admit, like I could walk down the, the aisle and I could hear everyone talking about me, but to have to stand up there and admit your fail, you know, your failure and you know, you're, it's not, it's not, a, it's an ugly thing. Admitting that you have an addiction to something is ugly. It's, right. it's not like your glorious moment in life. Right. Right. So, I mean, but yeah, I, I Eric invited, so it was his dad's church at yep. the time. He was the pastor of the church. Covenia Assembly of God, amen. Praise God, brother. <laughs> Pentecostal. Love and it, it wasn't close. Like, Cov <laughs> I, I was living in Tustin, so Covina wasn't close. Like, right. It was, it was about a 50-minute drive. Yeah. Um, about a solid 45 miles. But I had, I had stopped using, like, by the grace of God. Okay, now this is crazy. You got to talk about this because you didn't go to AA. You didn't go to rehab. You didn't have an intervention. Yep. How does that happen? Because I, I mean, with the exception painful. of, with the exception of shooting up, which you never did. Right. Correct. With the exception of that. I mean, you were taking the worst stuff, doing the worst stuff. And at the lowest, you were a hundred percent addicted. Yes. How did you stop? I think I finally decided that like I was done. And I think that's true. Like, I mean, I watch these shows or I've, you know, over light over time and just, well, I always have a place for people when, they say, you know, you only can stop someone when they're ready to stop. Like you can't convince someone to, to do, especially in that state, to stop doing anything that they don't want to do. But I think I was ready. I think I was done. Like it was, it wasn't a, Nancy had had her, had OD'd. Um, the girl that I was doing stuff, she'd OD'd on a different type of drug. But um, nonetheless, she OD'd. And I remember visiting her in the hospital and, you know, she was put in, uh, the hold, I don't even know what the number is, but that hold of suicidal hold. Yeah. Um, they had to pump her stomach and do the whole charcoal thing. But I remember walking into there thinking like, what am I doing? Like, this is, this is not me. Like I was, you know, you think of all the things like I've raised better. Like this is not me. Of course it took a few moments of those to like wake up, but um, I just didn't want to do it anymore. What could parents do? Because there's so many parents out there that were like your parents would be like, well, this isn't my fault. Right. Like, what could your parents have done different? Nothing? Like, I don't think so. I mean, you have to understand, I was not 16 or 15. You know, I was 21 years old, which is even crazier. Like, this started after I graduated with college from college. I mean, I graduated college with a, uh, the marketing award for the department. Like, I was <laughs> not like, you know, what you expected to do what I did or go down the path I went down. Um, but I think that's all part of what is interesting about drugs. It doesn't matter who, what, when, it doesn't matter how much money you have in your bank account right. or if you graduate from college or not, you know, it just happens to be where you're at at that time in your life when you take that first And the situation you're in, had you been in a better situation, that probably wouldn't have been an, right. attracted to you, right? Yeah. Or attractive to you. So, okay. So you're coming out. How do you not go to rehab? How do you come out? I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. Like, I mean, initially I was not going to church when I first got out or got done. Um, but coming off any drug is not pretty mm. painful and it's not, it's not good. It's not, it hurts. It's like, it, you know, you're getting rid of something. Um, but then I, I mean, I started going to church to like, I needed to fill my mind and fill my energy with something good something positive. And I had to get away from all the things around me that I had only known for so many months. I mean, it had been a year at least, right? Mm -hmm. um, where I knew only where to go, like, you know, back to the same problem. So I started going to church um, and I did it partially in the beginning, did it because 
I was interested in him. And interested in who? You. There you go. Yeah. Um, um but you said but it had yeah. been a year. It had not been a year. That it's, I, we're only talking about a couple months. That I was on drugs? No. Yeah. Oh, it had been a year since you were on yeah. drugs for a year, but yeah. it had only been a couple weeks. Correct. Of you being clean and you going to church. Right. But like I said, I was trying to fill my mind right. with positive things. I was, I couldn't just sit at home and do, you know, there's too many triggers. I couldn't hang out with the people I was hanging out with. I mean, it was a, you know. You but what to- was, I mean, what was different for you? Because so many people try church and try God. And it's like, ah, eh, I tried that. It didn't work. I mean. I think I had like a real live Holy Spirit experience. You weren't there one day. And, you know, this is new. I was raised Catholic. Like you don't. You just go kind of through the motions, and I was thankful that I was raised with some foundation, mm-hmm. but it's different, you know. So I went to church one day, and he wasn't. You weren't there, right? And um, you which, knew- by the way, that's how I knew she was the real deal. She was going even when I wasn't going, which was really attractive to me. But go they ahead. did like an altar call, and like I didn't know even know what an altar call was. Like I didn't know. I didn't know any. This was all super new to me, and I just remember, you know, giving my heart to the Lord. And someone praying with me, um, Sandy Footer was prayed with me, and I I didn't know who she was at the time, but you know, mm-hmm. um, and walking out just feeling like like a different person. This sounds really cliche to say like, oh, I walked out feeling like a different person because, you know, you hear that all the time, and people who are in the darkness think, oh, really? You, you know, you just felt like a different person. That's not possible, but it's possible. Like I walked out of there like free, free from like how I had been feeling for so long. Can you tell I'm almost going to cry? Yeah. (laughs) Like, I don't feel bad for you. Like, I'm so freaking proud of you because like, that's, that's the moment that I can say I fell in love with her. Like when I first saw her, I'm like, oh, this chick's hot. Like I'd be cool to date her. But I had never, I'd never been in love. Like I had a, you know, a couple girlfriends before that, but they're like high school, college. Like I didn't really know what love was. When she was coming out of the early service, I was walking into the late service and I saw her and I'd seen Terry a million times over the last year, whatever. And I go, how was church? And she goes, it was really good. And I said, you look different. She goes, yeah, I feel different. And I go, what's going on? She goes, I think I just gave my heart to Jesus. (laughs) And dude, I freaking instantly fell in love with her. Like instantly. Like I'm in church and I can't stop thinking about the girl. That's awesome. <laughs> That's so good. And so after that, you and I start dating. Yep. And there, there were a couple times, it, maybe you can highlight one, where the devil tried to creep back in and, and tempt you and pull you back into that, that life. Because I was still in the same environment. And right. I mean, in the fact that I was, you know, I was still living. In, I think by this time, me and, I, I, I can't remember the time frame, but the boyfriend was gone. I told him he needed to leave which was not pretty. Um, And like, you know, broken down doors, not pretty. Um, The cool thing too that I'm thinking back right now is like I tried to help. Like we had like Aaron Notariani, Dan Notariani. Like, dude, we had four and 500 pound guys working with us, like football players that all love Terry. And we're like, let us go in there and let us beat this guy, blah, blah, like blah, blah. And she would say like, no, I have to do this by myself. Yeah which was probably your biggest fear. Cause this yeah. guy, I mean, dude, he beat you mentally, physically. And then to break up with him, like he did not go quietly. No, it was not pretty. And then there was a few weeks where he had nowhere to go. So he was there until he found somewhere else to go. Um, but it was, you know, that was a big thing for me to do that, you know, break, like break free of him. Um, and break free. But there was times I remember I was doing something in my closet um, and had found, you know, drugs in my purse. And this and is a couple weeks being clean, A couple right? weeks being clean. So you're clean, but it's you're still struggling a little bit, right? Struggling, like you still absolutely. have the addiction trying to pull you back absolutely. in. Absolutely. Like, yeah, that's the, at that time, that was the easy, easier route. <clears throat> it's all I knew for so long, you know? Um, and it was, you know, the, it took all the emotion away. You know, emotion goes away with all that. You don't feel, I mean, that's why people behave and act and do the things they do, you know, when they're doing that stuff. It's, um, makes you numb. So I found some and I remember, I don't know if I called you or I don't remember. I ended up flushing down the toilet, which is crazy 
coming from someone who had been using to flush anything down the toilet. Yeah. I remember just thinking like the old person was like, you know, scrounging for anything. But like the new person was putting it in the toilet, which is like a victory. You know what I mean? For sure. Big I, victory. I, I do remember you calling me crying. And I mean, I'm young and I, I don't really know how to help someone do that. I don't remember what I said. I just remember you calling me crying and like, dude, you did it. You freaking broke through. You won. You, you beat, beat you beat addiction. Like, would you say you beat addiction? And I'm not trying to set you up too much here, but like with the people you surrounded yourself with and with your initiative and with God's covering. Yeah. I mean, I think it was, everything was put in place and I had to make the right choices because you were, you know, God was always there. I had to choose to go to church and choose to, you know, give my heart to the Lord. You were there in the office, but like I had to make the right choices to, you know, I think everything was laid there for me. I just had to make the right choices instead of going back to the wrong choices. Cool thing too, from like a, uh, I guess like a monetary standpoint, when she made that shift, her and I completely exploded and blew up. Our relationship was awesome, but dude, our business went through the roof. We broke off from the company. We went, we did it ourselves. We just her and I. We were worked under them, but we. <clears throat> yeah, but we went on our own. We went uh, uh, away from the covering. Like we had to pay rent. We had to pay fees. Yeah. But dude, our business went 10X and beyond. And it's funny, the the people who bashed her and didn't, and didn't want you around then came crawling back. They wanted you to work for them because they saw how well you and I were But, doing. you know, I wasn't like the stellar employee towards the end. Because, right. you know, you can't trust someone who's using. Totally. Like, it's, I mean, it's sad, you know, you'll, but I wasn't trustworthy towards the end. Not that I was stealing or doing anything like that, but, you know, it was getting in the way of so much of my life. I wasn't, I wasn't me. So in their defense, I understand why they, you know, it was their livelihood, their money. So I understand why they pushed it away. Mm -hmm. You know, but I loved when they came back because it's always nice when they come crawling back. <laughs> like, yeah, I wasn't going to charge you 300, but now I'll charge you 600. <laughs> oh, yeah, you, I remember you. I remember what you said. <laughs> but you've always been like, you've always been good to people. One thing that I've noticed about you, especially throughout the years, is you always welcome people back and everyone gets a second chance. But you, people, correct me if I'm wrong, but what I've noticed about you, which I actually think is a good thing is you welcome people back. Yeah. We can still be friends. Yeah. We can still be workers, but they don't have the access to you that they did the first time. Mm -hmm. They're not as close to you as they were the first time. It's kind of like something gets lost there. What is that about you? I just think it's like the part of me that's, uh, you know, a blessing and a curse too, is that I'm so loyal, which is why I think I, you know, like the, like for example, my relationship, I was so loyal despite all these, negative things happening um like i said i can't speak for why i stay it's just this weird you don't know until you know and it goes for all women i i i understand when they say that you know that you don't you can't tell me why you ask me why i stay because you've never walked in those shoes but i feel like i think that's part of being loyal is you know you'll you'll go to the ends of theirs for people but like you said if that gets broken or that gets ruined or destroyed there's always that little part of you that you know holds out a little bit just by nature i do want to ask you how can women who are in abusive relationship that know they should get out how can they get out is there a magic ingredient like what how do you get I out i mean it's mine mine was like i said no children which i know is complicates everything um i wasn't married to him um Thank you, Lord. And I think just making that choice, like making a choice to do it and sticking to your choice. Because I went back and forth many times, especially towards the end when it was really getting bad. I'd make a choice to leave and then I'd come back. Or I'd make a choice to leave and then he would sweet talk me back into it, you know, with letters and niceness and all this stuff. And it would be good for a little bit and then it would go back. So I think when I finally made that decision, because you're broken and you're weak and you feel all these things that don't make you feel strong. But the second that I made a choice, mm -hmm. it like gave me strength to keep going. 
What about to people who are in addiction or have someone that they know is in addiction and they're trying to come out? Are you a, are you a fan of rehab from what you know? Here's, here's what I like about rehab. It helps people. Obviously, it has results. The number one thing that I hate about rehab is that they put the label of an addict on them or an alcoholic on them for the rest of their life. Right. And I've never, ever heard you say that. Even when your relationship in the beginning wasn't as strong with the Lord compared to today, which is, you know, super solid. You, you never said, I'm Terry and, and I am an, an addict. I am a recovering addict. You, like you never put that on you. You were just, you were a new person. Right. Like that I mean, person I've, was dead. Right. And I've heard like once an addict, always an addict. But I always feel like I was, I was free. I was, God freed me from that. Like I'm not what I was, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not who I was. I'm not what I was doing. But, I mean, I think rehab's good in a lot of ways. I think it depends on where you're at. Like, I was had a lot of people around me that were, you know, rooting me on and steering me in the right place. I think not everyone has that in their life. So I think rehab can be good. Only thing tough with rehab is that you're around a bunch of people who also have the same problem you do, mm -hmm. which I think sometimes can be challenging, you know, because you're sharing stories and it's a it's a challenging place to be. But... I think I could have done, had a lot of positivity in going there. It scared me though. When he said to me, like, you need to go to rehab. Like I was like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to rehab. Why? Because you were scared or because you knew it couldn't help you? Because I didn't want to be known as the girl who went to rehab. You know, like. It was just yeah. your thing. Just what you. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, it is at the time I was like, that's like, it's almost was like a, you know, it was almost kind of like taboo. Like that would be on my family. Like, oh, their daughter went to rehab. Like, it's not a positive thing. Right. And I, you know, everyone knew everyone. And I grew up in a place that like, you know, those things aren't supposed to happen to kids like us. Right. You know, even though it was happening everywhere. Oh, all over. No one really talked about no it. No one talked that's about it. That's why, you know, you know, not to, you know, because I'm your husband, I'm proud of you. But like, that's what I admire you. Like your courage. Like you did face your biggest fear. You said, hey, this is what I did. But when people look at you now, the the people who were. Uh, the people who are around you who were in that experience, like none of them to this day, no one ever looks at you as the girl who used to use or right. the girl who was that. Cause like, you know, some of like, you know, uh, Jason Weed or Danian Rios, you know, Dan, Aaron, Notariani. These are still some of my closest friends. I, I highly doubt they look at you as like, Oh, that's the girl that used to like, right. you're just a different person. You rewrote a new story. Like right. that girl's dead, which is interesting to think about is like, you surrounded yourself with people where you wanted to be, not surrounded yourself with people who were where you were at. Right. I'm not saying that's the answer. I'm just saying that's a pretty cool thought. Well, they always say when I watch these rehab shows too, that you can't go back to the, your life, the same people, the same friends, the same thing. And for me, Nancy was removed from my life because of what had happened with her. Um, she was not with the company anymore because she had OD'd and had her own stuff. So that was helpful for me because she was like my, you know, my person I did everything with. Um, but see that started going to my, my, I was doing it by myself all the time. So I think just like, you know, like you said, just, I, like I told you, I was trying to fill my mind and fill my days with positive things that didn't revolve around that. And I didn't have to, I didn't have to see certain people that were a constant reminder. I'll never forget you and I had been married for like two years and Nancy tried to come back in your life. Yep. She sent you something in the mail. It was like a CD and it was wrapped in Christian stuff and godly stuff. And I don't know where to this day. I really do hope she's doing well. Um, I don't know where on social media or following on social media or anything like that. So I really don't know how well she's doing. I hope she's doing well because the package that she sent you sounded like she was doing well. It was, you know, I found God. I've done this. I've done that. But you didn't respond. No. You didn't go back. Why? That's like opening because it looked good from the outside. Like, I'm so proud of you. You know, your life's good. This was before Facebook. But why didn't you? I just think that's like opening up a package that you just don't know the outcome. Like, you know, I didn't, that person even looked at that time when I met her, didn't look like that type of person. So I just feel like I just, it was safer just to leave it alone. And like you said, I was a whole different person. Like, it was, I had already closed that chapter. You know, I was in a new book. I wasn't trying to open up that. And, you know, it, she wasn't a good friend. So I don't know. I, I just felt like there was nothing there to rekindle. It was just a good 
moment for me to know that she was doing well. There you go. Uh, one of the cool things that not a lot of people know is Uh-oh, I'm scared. so no. I love sentences like that it. start like this. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so after so you and I start dating in like March of 03 and now it's March 2020. We've been dating for 18 years. Right. We've it was been Easter, for remember? 16 years. Yeah, it was. Yeah. I remember waking up and you doing like the Cadbury bunny noise. Yeah. So annoying. <laughs> I didn't say do right it. into the microphone. <laughs> I know, right? Dude. And it's by just the as way, annoying in person as it is on the microphone. <laughs> and then, hey, dude, hashtag side note for all of you husbands. The stuff that I did to win her over in 2003, because the guy that she was with never opened a door for her, never bought her flowers, never did really date her, took her out. He wasn't a gentleman. He wasn't a gentleman. That was 18 years ago. And here we are 18 years later. Be honest. Do I still do the same stuff to win you over? And Minus the Cadbury noise? I don't yeah. do the Cadbury <laughs> noise anymore unless you want me to. No, I'm good. Thank you for that. But no, I mean, I think a lot of guys in marriage and stuff, we get so complacent and so used to like, oh, well, she's not going anywhere. And, you know, you might well, I not. Think, but- yeah, like when you did it in the beginning, like I remember that big Easter mm. balloon. Like he, you know, he went above and beyond. Um, I tried to wow her. He did. <laughs> and I remember like I had never, that had never happened. Like I never those things we never did like that wasn't part of the love language if you want to call it love I don't even know if that word could be associated with that relationship but um you know it was your love language but yeah I mean it was you still do that absolutely I gotta win you every day you I do. don't want you looking anywhere else no. you know what I'm saying yeah it's not happening babe like <laughs> I'm trying to get better looking but I don't know if I am no it's your heart <laughs> it's impossible yeah. you look so good but know, here's right? the cool thing that I was going to say you and that nice shirt of yours <laughs> right <laughs> look at that I tried to match you today with my uh, oh that's cute my color for those of you who are listening and not watching on YouTube Terry and I kind of similar have colors that we was do. planned um, but when Creepy. when my wife gave her heart to the Lord in 2003 2003 yep the lady that led her to the Lord Sandy Footer my mom led her to the Lord in 1974. And she didn't know who I was at church. Like she, she didn't, didn't do it because. That's wild. Yeah. So of course, well, I mean, I've talked about it before. My mom would end up passing away in 2004, right before Terry and I got married. Greatest source of encouragement of my life. And when she passed away, I didn't find out until after she passed mm-hmm. away that my mom led this lady to the Lord and this lady led my wife to the Lord. That's, like, come on, it's crazy. Bro. Talking about reaping the fruit. You dude, know? Like, <laughs> seriously. Yeah. That was a really cool story to hear. Cause like oh, I said, dude, I, she didn't know me. She didn't know who I was. She didn't know I knew him. Like there was no connection. I, and I was by myself that day. So I wasn't sitting with your family, Yep. but yeah, I mean, I lost it dude. When I found that out, cause yeah. Sandy footer told me that probably like a month After before your, Terry and I got yeah, married. Yeah. Cause I was still grieving the loss of my mom. My mom died in July of 04. Terry and I get engaged in August of 04, which I had already planned on asking her to engage me. I think the latter part of my mom's life where it got really bad and she got really sick kind of delayed the engagement. So I probably would have gotten engaged to Terry March or April of 04. We would have, we, we knew when we started dating, like within a couple months, we were like, we're going to get married. The first time I saw her dad when she got hired and I said this kind of jokingly, but Hey, what you speak out in the air, you know, there's power in, you know, <laughs> life and death in the power of your tongue. The first time I met her dad, I said, Hey, I'm Matt Rogers and I'm going to marry your daughter. Oh, that's strong. And he said, okay, sure. Yeah, yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> you know, I'm a 310 pound, you know, Take football player. Yeah. His wife you know, or his daughter's the, you know, perfect little angel and <laughs> daddy's coming to town. Well, but, uh, don't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> right. Dude, there's so much, but the one, the way you're talking about your mom, the cool part of, you know, our journey too was that a week I got to spend, you know, like a week, like a year, mm-hmm. a good year. Like the last few months were rough, but of her being part of our life, knowing that we were going to be married and knowing that we were going to be together. Right. You know, just a cool add to your mom's story. And so your, your life turns around, you and I are dating. Um, I mean, did everything change for you? Like, did you... Like, was it God that turned everything around for you? Because your whole life changed. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there was no denying that. I mean, for as far as, like, my addiction part of my life, 100%. Because where I was at, it should have never turned away, turned that way without something. And everyone will say, like, well, what was it? Oh, what was it? And when I say God, you know, you get the doubters. Mm-hmm. Like, no way that could it be that. And I'm like, no, it really, it really was. 
Well, plus like, people who don't believe, they're like, yes. oh, that's good for you. She was right. weak and she was broken and she just needed something right. to lean on. But it's not really that, right? No. I mean, it's deeper because until you walk through someone's shoes who was where I was, it couldn't just be that easy. There was no way it should have been that easy. Now, I'm not saying easy that it just was no problems. There was a lot of problems and struggles, but it came it came with making that decision to give my heart to the Lord. What was the biggest thing you noticed after you gave your heart to the Lord? If you had to pick Peace, one thing. I think I would say. And like a, a joy again, because like the light joy had been robbed. You know, you don't hear of someone who's doing what I was doing and be joyful. They don't go hand in hand. So I think just having like joy and happiness, like kind of like back to the who person I was, you know, who I knew I was that I had been, you know, had been stolen from me. You know, what also is really cool about my wife when she, when she talks about her past, of course we're married now and like that's her ex-boyfriend. I always joke with her about her always ex-boyfriend. Jokes. Like, yeah. Oh, whatever. <laughs> like, you know, cause I'm an alpha male and I don't like the idea of another dude being with my wife before I was and all that stuff. But I will say this when it comes to him. And then when it comes to Nancy, that girl that influenced her bad, after my wife had given her life to the Lord to this day, she never says bad stuff about those people. Like I can tell you're not bitter towards your ex-boyfriend. No. You're not bitter towards Nancy. No. Like you've, you haven't told them you forgave them because you never really had that. But I don't need to. But you don't need, like you've forgiven them in your heart. Yeah. Which I think is so, like I think that's why God has taken you to where you are because God works with what you give them. And if he's working with unforgiveness, you know, we say, oh, well, God has no limits. Nah, that's not necessarily true. God can't operate in unforgiveness. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, hear me when I'm trying to say that. Like, God can do whatever he wants. But God can't really transform someone's heart if there's bitterness and unforgiven, you know, ness there. And you've never had that. You released yourself of that. And that allowed, in my opinion, God and the Holy Spirit to take you to where you're at now. Do you think that's true? Yeah, and I think I was in a better, I mean, I'm, I was in a good place and you only can pray and hope that people around you are in a good place too. I mean, I know that they have moved on and their lives have, you know, moved on and done their thing. But I, I kind of, I don't say anything, I forgive and I move on, but you know, you don't forget and you just, you just learn. I think that's part of all the stuff too. I learned about people. I learned about choices. I learned about, you know, I, I was, took a different path. My path went high and didn't matter what was happening below me, you know, included those people. And, you know, even if those people were down there on below me, like I moved up. So there you, go. you leveled up. <laughs> <laughs> you like that tea up? <laughs> yes. And I want to, I want to tee this up uh, for next episode because you, I mean, you know, now you're healthy, you got your joy back, you've given your life to the Lord uh, you and I get engaged. We're about to get married, and then we get married, and then that's when life really begins. Yep. Is marriage? Do you think what you went through helped you get through and overcome what you were about to go through with with our kids that you didn't see coming down the road? Well, I think. I mean, obviously, my faith and have you know giving my heart to the Lord and. You know, anytime you go through anything challenging, you know, there's always those doubts at the moment of, you know, where's God, where, what's happening. But if you don't have any questions to ask, I think you're, you're going to be really lost. So I didn't have any, if I didn't have my faith and I didn't have what I had already gained along that journey of where I had been and where I went. Then when those things happen with our kids, I would have no one to ask like, why? And I think you know, it, it brought me to that point of, you know, not giving up. If I didn't have gone through the path I already, already, I mean, there was no option to give up, not give up. You know what I mean? Even though you wanted to. Oh yeah, absolutely. And this is when real depression set in your life Yep. and overcoming real depression, like a sick kid, a diagnosis that there's no cure for. I mean, real depression. Yeah, I mean, those are the words you never expect to hear. So we're going to talk about that next week. I'm teasing it. We're going to end right there. 
about your past and what you went through, what would be one thing you can tell the listeners or the viewers of if, if they're stuck right now and they don't like where they're at, how can they level up and get to the next phase of their life or overcome the addiction, get out of the abusive relationship, whatever it be? I mean, I think it's different for everybody. I think everyone's, you know, someone's addiction is not the same as someone else because I feel like it's where you're at. So when you need to look, you know, I was in a bad relationship. I was in a bad this. Um, I just think making that decision, making that choice and then going with your plan, not going back and forth. I think putting your foot down and making the decision and knowing that you're doing the right thing. And I think finding someone to cheer you along. Like I feel like a lot of times I was alone and it wasn't until I found people who were actually cheering me along that made me realize like I, I, I should get out of this. I need to get out of this. So I think like making the decision to do it and then finding someone to surround yourself that wants to see better for you. Don't be double-minded. A double-minded person gets nothing from God, even though they crave much and surrounding yourself with the right people. Absolutely. This is a great setup to next week. Will you be my first two-part podcast? Oh, gosh. I don't know. I'm scared. I mean, we went through your past. Now, I mean, we haven't even talked about our marriage. We haven't even talked about our three kids. We haven't even talked about the diagnosis, the depression, the move, everything. It's a lot. It is a lot. You've been with me through some stuff, huh? We've been together, baby. (laughs) Don't you be double-minded and make sure you make a decision to tune in next week for Terry Rogers Part 2 Because we have so much to talk about. Our move, our kids, the diagnosis, depression, everything. This episode, make sure you like, subscribe, share it. Please, that's the most important thing I could ask. Please share this with one person. With one person. If everyone shared with one person, we would double and this thing continues to grow. We're extremely blessed, but we want it to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Can't do it without you. Please like, subscribe, and share. This has been another week of Level Up.